All right, I think uh, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, so my name is uh, Ben Snively. Uh, I'm a uh, specialist solutions architect uh, in the um, in the big data and analytical space. Uh, so in today's session, uh, we're gonna be uh, we want to switch over back to the presentation, uh, but we're gonna be covering how to use the AI services to build intelligent capabilities and intelligent applications. Uh, so, in doing so, we're going to be talking about uh, various use cases uh, when it comes to AI services, uh, ranging from uh, citizen uh, use cases, how to improve citizen uh, um, uh, participation, how to improve education, how to get content out to uh, various individuals. So, uh, we're going to step through uh, a few use cases first and then talk about the technology under the covers, what that architecture looks like in order to provide that capability, uh, and then uh, give a, a few demonstrations. So, we're actually going to include about three different demonstrations as we're going to have our discussion today. So, starting off, um, you know, really, what are some intelligent applications that we're seeing within public sector? Um, this isn't a full list, but just wanted to call out a few different use cases. Uh, the first is really modernizing uh, citizen services. Uh, and we're going to be stepping through what this looks like, both uh, as a use case pattern, as well as what it looks like at, at an architecture level. Um, also, to improve education. Uh, so we're working with many different educational institutes to be able to help add machine learning into their capabilities. Uh, we're going to be talking about one uh, uh, public case study, uh, Echo360, and what they're doing with uh, some of these services uh, in a bit. Uh, how to improve uh, public health services uh, using these services, um, content management systems and how content management systems could really be improved using AI services and machine learning services. Uh, and then lastly, uh, what some of the space looks like within fraud analytics and uh, risk management. So um, I promise there's only a few slides here and then we're going to dive into you know, the tech, the architecture, what it looks like under the covers. Uh, but one of the first examples that we we're going to give is really modernizing citizen services. And the one we're going to focus on, uh, and we're seeing uh, this being pretty well adopted both within the commercial and the public sector space, is how to build a contact contact center um, so it's very very intuitive and um, it responds well to the folks calling in so that could be citizens trying to get help uh, trying to get information within your organization uh, or it might be you know other types of use cases uh, within a private um, you know nonprofit uh, ed tech that sort of thing so and it's all about being able to use AI services uh, to be able to understand uh, really uh, what's happening within the, those citizens, uh, what's happening, what's the sediment, what's uh, of the negative things being discussed, uh, what are some of the different entities being related to those. Uh, in the education space, we're going to talk uh, about how to use artificial intelligence and these AI services to really better provide student services uh, within the organization. Um, one example uh, is uh, actually Echo360. Um, they provide a video and active learning system uh, for many higher ed education uh, institutes. Um, you know, just to show an example, uh, what they're doing is they're using uh, machine trans uh, transcription. So anytime um, uh, the lecturers, the professors are giving presentations, not only do they have what the slide is uh, being presented, but they also correlate that to what the professor is saying. And then they're able to provide a content system so that anytime somebody wants to search on what's being said or what's being shown within the screens, they could pull that information back, um, which also drives a lot of interesting metadata. They could also take that data and see what areas are uh, students searching on the most to be able to inform the professors, oh, maybe you need to uh, understand or uh, maybe you need to focus on this area a little bit more. Students are going back to this area versus that area, um, that sort of metadata. Uh, another one we're going to step through is how to use these services to improve, uh, to improve public health services. Um, one, uh, another customer um, doing this today is uh, you know, Beth Israel Medical Center. Um, they're leveraging uh, Amazon Comprehend to be able to speed up um, the detection uh, of uh, these forms that need to be validated to be able to understand which forms are going to be delayed or canceled uh, and able to use natural language processing. Uh, we're going to be showing some demos of Comprehend Medical actually in a few moments, uh, but they're leveraging services such as Comprehend Medical to be able to identify the forms and which forms are going to be um, you know, delayed or canceled, uh, that sort of thing. I know this is a quick survey. We're going to dive into each of these and, and talk about the architecture, uh, the services, that sort of thing. I promise in about two more slides. Um, the, another one we're going to step through is how to use these AI services for content management systems. 
Uh, so with content management systems, it's all about providing the right content to the right users uh, and having them be able to consume that content. Uh, what's really interesting is machine learning really helps in a, a lot of different elements of those phases. So it could be with the collection of the data. Uh, it could be uh, if it's imagery or audio or multimedia, how to take that data and make it searchable so that anytime I, I want to search for Ben Franklin, I get not only the text that referenced Ben Franklin, but any images, any video, uh, if there's video back uh, then, but uh, that sort of thing to be able to um, get that information out. Um, it also allows you to do semantic queries. So uh, we're going to be showing how to take that data uh, and be able to use that to build dashboards and a better understanding of what content is in your content management system. And then um, fraud detection. Uh, rather than stepping through each of these use cases, um, we had uh, FINRA actually co-present with us at this past re-event. Uh, um, talking a little bit about how they're leveraging AI services. So uh, FINRA has been building large data lakes on our platform for some rot, for some time, uh, dealing with a lot of uh, challenges like uh, heterogeneous data sets, getting data into a canonical form, being able to analyze that data, that sort of thing. Uh, but what they did is they actually took a whole bunch of unstructured data. Uh, so this unstructured data uh, provides brokerage information uh, in order to un understand which brokers uh, might be at risk uh, and be able to intervene on that. On that. Um, they process um, you know, millions of documents every year, unstructured documents. So this is in addition to the 135 billion events that they get every year, or, or every day, I should say, 135 billion stock events. Uh, so it's a very, very, um, uh, the situation is they have very structured data coming in, but they need to also bring in this unstructured data and do natural language processing on the data. Um, and it's uh, in the form of those forms, documents, free uh, style text, reference information. Um, so those are some of the different use cases we're going to step through. We're really going to dive into a lot of the detail now. So thanks for bearing with me. Uh, um, and it's really going to start with um, the AI services that Amazon has to offer. So uh, we'll talk about next where this fits into the stack of the ML uh, portfolio, the ML stack uh, within Amazon. Uh, but these AI services, they're all about providing uh, intuitive APIs to be able to call and add intelligence into your system. And you don't necessarily have to be a data scientist, you don't have to be a data engineer to leverage these services. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, if I'm, uh, if I'm an organization that wants to be able to build a forecast model to understand the amount of electricity that's going to be used within different areas, um, you can do that using these services. If you want to be able to build recommendation engines and recommend, oh, this stu student was taking this course, maybe they'll like this other course. Uh, those sorts of capabilities where it's all API driven and you don't necessarily have to be an ML or data, uh, data science expert. Uh, where this fits within the stack is uh, we're talking about this high, the highest level uh, of, the, of the tiered stack that you see here. Uh, so these AI services, uh, as I mentioned, they're all about providing capabilities. Uh, they're all built, uh, they're continuously trained to be able to provide certain capabilities. And we're going to step through a lot of those capabilities next. Um, not the intent of this discussion. There's lots of other discussions stepping through the other levels of the stack. I want to include this slide so folks are cognizant of what those other levels are. Um, just very, very quickly at the ML services level, it's all about being able to empower data scientists and data engineers to streamline the ML process, uh, ranging from building, training, deploying your models. So it's all about streamlining that process. Uh, and you know, services like Amazon SageMaker are really catered towards being able to do that uh, within your organization. And then at the lowest level, it's all about you know, the, the deep data scientists being uh, very proficient at the lower level uh, infrastructure. So uh, for example, you know, being able to leverage FPGAs or GPUs and have access to the lowest level uh, of the infrastructure to be able to control any of those knobs. But we're really going to focus uh, at this top level. Uh, so at this top level uh, are the AI services uh, built to be able to provide these intelligent capabilities. Uh, and they really range from things like vision services. Uh, so if I'm building a content system and I want to recognize uh, anytime Ben Franklin is, is in a book, uh, I could use these vision services. Or uh, what we're going to demo in a moment, let's say I have a scan document and I want to extract the content out of a scan document, which is really an image, but there's textual information in that. How can I use the vision services? Uh, we're going to demonstrate Textract in a moment to get that content out of the, the scanned image to be able to do something with it. 
Uh, there's speech services, uh, being able to do things like text-to-speech and speech-to-text, uh, language processing. Uh, so we're not going to demonstrate translate uh, today, uh, but we are going to demonstrate comprehend and comprehend medical, which allows you to do natural language processing, understanding entities, key phrases, medical terms, medical brands, uh, different anatomy parts, and the references between those uh, within natural language processing. And then uh, chatbots uh, to be able to provide conversational bots, and then uh, forecasting and pr uh, personalization. So my favorite part, let's dive into how these services are actually being used with some of the uh, use cases and architectures we were talking about a moment ago. Uh, and we're going to start with uh, uh, modernizing uh, you know, citizen services, uh, focusing on the, uh, the contact center uh, use case uh, at first here. Um, so in this architecture, um, and we have you know, various contents, we, there's actually some solutions that you as a customer can launch these solutions and it'll stand up a lot of this infrastructure for you. Uh, so there's a lot of good content out there if you want to use either this entire architecture or pieces of the architecture to really jumpstart that process. Uh, so if you see a lot of boxes, that can be streamlined, uh, but they're the Lego, Lego pieces being put together. So with Amazon Connect, uh, uh, the first thing that happens, and this this flow could be using this flow could use other contact centers as well. Uh, obviously, Amazon Connect is a great product, uh, but it's all about getting the audio feed first uh, from that call center. So as soon as that audio feed lands in that repository, oftentimes the data lake, uh, some things could happen right away. Um, and keep in mind, I might have some time to show some code here, but a lot of this flow could be set up in a few hundred lines of code. Uh, so a lot of this is built on serverless capabilities. Um, there's not a lot of code that you have to develop as a customer uh, to be able to plumb a lot of this together. Uh, but so you have the audio file. There's also contact uh, records. Uh, this is essentially metadata of what the phone number uh, called in, who the customer is, or who the uh, you know any metadata that's associated to uh, that contact center, uh, that contact trace record. Oh. Leveraging these AI services, the type of things you can do is if you have an audio file, uh, the first thing that you do is do things like using a serverless workflow, you could transcribe that audio file. And through the transcription process, and multiple languages are supported through the transcription process, uh, you can do things like speaker identification. Uh, so I don't know who, uh, the different speakers, but identify there's you know, n number of speakers in this audio, uh, audio file and identify which speaker is uh, speaking at which time. Uh, or you could also set it up where if you have multiple channels within that audio feed, uh, it could identify the different channels and the transcriptions, uh, all time series, uh, based on the, the channels of that audio feed. So there's, uh, there's a lot of depth in terms of the features within each of these services, which uh, I wish I could go into, but I don't think you'd want to sit here for like the next uh, few hours with me talking about you know, the depth of one service here. So, um, But this, this first takes that audio file and creates the text uh, representation from that file. Then, using things like natural language processing, you, you could take that data, uh, extract entities, extract key phrases, extract the sediment, and this is the data that will really be able to say, okay, this contact center, these customers calling in were maybe upset. What agents did they talk to? What was being said uh, in terms of entities, key phrases, that sort of thing, and really allow you to start building some of those dashboards. Um, one solution is using Elasticsearch uh, with uh, various uh, front ends like Kibana. Um, there's a couple different options. You know, uh, this is just showing one reference architecture that we see many customers take. Uh, but it's all about being able to then drive these dashboards to give you that awareness, to give you that situation of uh, when these different elements were um, uh, pulled there. So, so um, I promise there's two more slides, and I'm going to switch to some cool demos. Uh, so um, another example is being able to innovate the content management system. Uh, and with this, um, in this example, we're taking scanned content. So this could be a library system, it could be our archives, it could be medical forums, it could be uh, multiple different uh, examples, but you have sc scanned uh, content. And let's say you want to take that scanned content and power uh, um, a, um, a document system to be able to search for that content. Uh, in this architecture, we're going to be stepping through this during the demo, but we're going to be taking scanned uh, information, uploading it to S3, uh, so that could be from scanners or from whatever source. And we're going to be driving this workflow kind of live in a demonstration here. It's first going to perform OCR uh, to be able to extract the content out of that, out of that document. Uh, it's then going to run natural language processing to understand not only terms and entities within the document, 
uh, but also the medical terms within there. Uh, and then it's all going to be powering some dashboards that we're going to dive into. So let's go ahead and um, switch over to the laptop to give a quick presentation of, uh, of what we're showing here. And uh, in order to show that, we're really going to start off uh, with a uh, S3 location. So, so we have this location in S3, uh, and this represents uh, various scan documents that have been uploaded into the system. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and upload a new document. The Wi-Fi always is very, very quick when you're uploading uh, on stage. Oh, it actually was quick. Uh, <laughs> so we uploaded this new document, uh, you know, uh, just now called uh, Public Sector Summit 2019. I'm very creative with my names. Uh, what this is really doing under the covers is the first thing that we're doing is we're actually calling Textract uh, to be able to uh, extract this information. And what Textract is doing is and I should, I should really show the document so you see what document we just uploaded. Uh, this is very representative of lots of scanned documents that I see, uh, where um, keep in mind, it, this looks like real data. This is not real data. It's, uh, it's fake data. Uh, but if we take a look at this, uh, this document, you'll notice uh, this scanned document is not oriented right side up, right? It's angled and upside down. And this is the document we're going to be running through the content system to be able to first extract all this information out of it and then power the dashboards to understand what this information uh, is, what, what information is within here. So that's the document we're going to be running through here. Uh, this is Textract. Um, so rather than showing a whole bunch of slides on what Textract is, I like to show the service because it's just more fun as a techie. Um, but what Textract really provides is um, capabilities to take scanned images of, of documents and extract information. That information could just be text like you see here under the raw text field where it has the various words within it. Uh, but it also could be things like uh, what if I want to extract the table information out of here. So what's really nice about this is with the table information it's preserving the column names and the column values. So not only do you have the text and what row it represented on, but it was under this column. So it preserves that information when you're extracting it out of the document, which is really critical information in terms of understanding really what the document uh, was to which it was referring. So let's go ahead and upload uh, this, uh, this document over here. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to upload this over here. And I'm going to just drag and drop. Oops, maybe I'll do it this way. Upload. My uh, drag and drops always end up uh, doing that on stage. Uh, so, so we just uploaded this. You'll notice it's still upside down. It's still oriented uh, the other way, but it's able to extract this information out. Keep in mind, this is not real PHI data. This is not a real person. This is all open data in the medical field. So don't be alarmed if you see medical terms and fake diagnostics and stuff like that. But I want to show a realistic example of being able to take this information and extract first the words out of it. We're going to do much more. We're going to do natural language on the text itself. We're going to do next steps. Um, but before we do that, the other thing that's uh, kind of really nice about being able to pull this sort of information out is with form data, you oftentimes have key values, right? You have Ben, uh, or first name Ben, last name Snively, uh, uh, occupation, solutions architect. Uh, so those are all key pairs. And those key pairs are really useful information as well. So one of the things you'll notice here is this is actually pulling out the form information. So this key name matches this pair. And that could also power your NoSQL database, your document-oriented database, uh, Elasticsearch, different uh, repositories become searchable uh, within there. So, um, so you can actually see um, the field names actually show up underneath the field values in this example, but that's not always the case. Sometimes it'll be like to the left, sometimes it'll be above. Um, so the service is able to recognize the different orientations of where the field name is in respect to the value of that field. So, so we have this uh, uh, over here now, and we have, we have the text. We're, we're super happy, we're excited. Um, the next thing that we could do is we could actually start pulling out uh, some of the information from that. Uh, so in order to do that, we're uh, going to uh, launch into Comprehend. Uh, 
uh, and, and comprehend, uh, so this is performing natural language processing. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm actually gonna take that text that you just saw, and I'm going to paste it uh, right in here. So this is the text that you just saw within TextShack. The automated pipeline that got kicked off when we uploaded that document is doing this all automatically for us. I'm just stepping through the process so you see kind of the incremental stages of what's happening um, to be able to uh, power the, the, um, the dashboards. Uh, so if we actually go over here and hit Analyze, uh, what this is doing is uh, it's doing entity extraction under this tab. Uh, so entity extraction uh, is identifying entities. An entity might be a person, a place, a, uh, a organization, a date. Uh, various uh, entity always has a category or a type, uh, and it's pulling that information out. What we could also see is we could th see things like key phrases. So within here, you see key phrases like um, uh, uh, prescription uh, uh, nasal spray and uh, only clear. Uh, yeah, you see uh, uh, phrases in the medical field. <laughs> Um, what we could also do is we could also uh, plug this into uh, Comprehend Medical. Uh, so this is specially trained uh, on medical terms in the medical field. And what, one of the things you'll notice is um, right away it's uh, the different categories are medical specific. So this is identifying uh, names as prote potential PHI information. Other information might be uh, protected information like the date of birth, uh, that sort of thing. But the other, um, the nice thing I like to show here is uh, within this, you'll notice these correlations, right? Uh, so the test, uh, the test name is this was a test for weight. The value was 130, and the units were pounds. So not only do you get the medical information, you get that correlation, the linkage between um, the different entity types. Um, the same th sort of thing where if it's about medicine, you'll, you'll be able to pull out this medicine was the, uh, uh, intended to be delivered this way type of information. So all that's, uh, all that's running and, and powering, um, that, that flow uh, ends up getting pushed into an Elasticsearch cluster. And that Elasticsearch cluster, um, this is running Amazon Elasticsearch. Um, part of the service provides a Kibana front end uh, within uh, the Elasticsearch cluster. And within here, what we see is, uh, this is just one of the different ways you could, uh, you could query this data. Um, if I actually search for uh, or if I go in here and uh, so you'll notice right here, uh, this is actually the document we just uploaded uh, moments ago. So um, as I was talking, granted I talked for a while there, uh, but that it, it got ingested before just now. Uh, but that entire process uh, from running through text check, running Comprehend, running Comprehend Medical was all completely automated as soon as I uploaded that document. So this document is, is, is the one that just got ingested uh, through this entire pipeline during this demo. And one of the things you'll notice is, oh, I saved this one as a PNG instead of a JPEG. I didn't realize that, but the server still handles the PNG. Um, and what we can see here is we can actually uh, take a look and even though this was an image, uh, right, this was a scanned image, uh, these are all the entity, uh, different entity types that got extracted out. So you see things like location of Seattle, uh, different persons, uh, uh, different, uh, the physician. So this physician information was extracted from the key value pair out of Textract. And the nice thing about this is if this is powering a content management system, we're able to run uh, OCR on it, we're able to run uh, natural language processing on it, populate this content system, and now the system itself, I could go up here and do things like search for uh, you know, any physician named Bob. Remember, this is a, a key field out of the form. So uh, the, the OCR was able to identify that key name and, and say, okay, this key name uh, was Bob. So it's not any patient that was Bob. It wasn't Bob in the document. It was Bob in the form name of, of physician, um, all, all kind of powering this. So the, um, the other thing we can show here is uh, being able to um, you could aggregate all this information together. Um, so these are various entities. The diagnosis is on the top left. Um, the various organs are on the bottom right. So all this information, uh, again, powered through that, uh, that data flow uh, for that content system. So um, if we could switch back over to the presentation, we're gonna do a few more slides um, and then uh, switch back to a, a couple more demos. Uh, what we're gonna talk about next um, is, uh, really how to take this. Um, so we, we demoed a lot of this. I, I have these slides just because they get posted on SlideShare and that sort of thing. So I like uh, the deck to, 
to have a lot of the information. Uh, but what we're going to be talking about next is being able to take that um, take information that you have in your system. So it could be in a data lake, it could be in a data warehouse, it could be in a database, uh, and being able to um, take that and build prediction models. And I skipped a whole bunch of slide. Uh, the AV folks are going to love me, but can we go ahead and switch back? Um, uh, just because time-wise, uh, I want to show uh, one more demo showing um, uh, uh, being able to build forecast models next. So what we're going to show here is we're going to show uh, first um, Amazon Forecast. So Amazon Forecast allows you to build various forecast models. So this could be forecasting demand, it could be forecasting workforce, it could be forecasting supplies. Uh, so a lot of different uh, examples to be able to forecast uh, information. Um, it's a high-level AI service. What this means is even though you have access to things like tuning the hyperparameters if you want, you do have access to low-level constructs if you like, you don't have to have that ML expertise to build a lot of these forecast models. And the way that uh, the service works is uh, when you build your model, uh, you bring your data into the service and specify uh, a lot of different kind of features that you could, uh, that you could uh, distinguish as you're bringing the data in. So for example, with time series data, um, things like cold start and missing data are two really kind of key challenges that a lot of customers face on time series uh, data sets or time series forecasting. Uh, so in here, what you could do is you could say, okay, I want to use these algorithms, which might you know, handle cold start a little bit better. For example, I'm going to demo deep AR in a moment. Um, or you could also do things like specify fill methods. So if there is missing data, do I want to treat that as a null? Do I want to be able to fill that in with other values? So maybe a null really means a zero in my system. So um, when you're bringing the data in, you can define the different schemas and how to handle the various fields within that schema. Um, and what we're going to do now, uh, I'm going to skip to show uh, a little bit on the forecasting side. Uh, so within here, what we could do, uh, so this is electricity data. And what, uh, what I could do is I could specify, uh, there's multiple time series uh, within this data set. Uh, and it really kind of goes back um, to uh, end of 2012. Uh, so I'm going to uh, start mid-month of December. But I'm going to go kind of into uh, kind of the future of where this data set ends and say, okay, what's going to be the predicted value uh, over this range? Um, and then here we can uh, predict, select different predictors. Uh, there's an auto ML feature to be able to have it pick the right model for the, for the data that you have. And what we could do here is we could actually uh, say, go ahead and get forecast. Uh, I could, uh, oh, uh, I have to select a, a customer that uh, is a real ID there. Um, and what you see here is the time series forecast that got predicted for this client for electricity. Uh, and what's really interesting is as I switch, I'm going to switch between a few different clients. It's the same model. Uh, it's the same algorithm under the covers. It's the same service. I had to train it once across all these time series. But what you'll notice is a lot of these have different seasonalities, right? So this one has two really big spikes uh, on these two days. Then it dies down a little bit. Two more spikes, it dies down. I don't know if it's the week. I didn't correlate it to the weekends or where the, the spikes happen. But the time series was able to identify um, kind of that, that pattern within the data. Uh, what we could do here is we could actually take this and uh, do a different customer, a different client, and you'll notice a lot less of a, a seasonality, right? A lot less of a pattern that's happening. Um, and I should have mentioned that the, the dotted lines show you the, the uh, probability, uh, the percentage, how likely it is it's going to be within the ranges. Uh, so it is a probabilistic model that gives you a range, not just a single value for each of the data points. And that, that range will tell you how confident it is, right? So if, uh, if I take an 80% confidence and, and the numbers are this wide versus that wide, um, you know, it's a lot more confident with, within that range or uh, within that um, um, element. The, um, just to show one more example, this is uh, just another one, uh, another client. And in this example, you'll notice uh, there, there is some seasonality, but it's not two big spikes, a whole bunch of subtleness, two big spikes. So uh, it's much more like a sine wave in this example or a, uh, a, a pretty consistent pattern. Um, so building, this, building these models, what you could do, uh, you take your data in, you do a data prep phase, you could have the auto ML feature um, build various uh, models for you, uh, and then deploy out the predictors. 
Uh, these are, as of right now, uh, uh, various algorithms that we support under the covers. Uh, so under the covers, it's using a lot of common machine learning and deep learning algorithms to build this model. Uh, but the service is really kind of doing a lot of that work for you. I'm going to go ahead and um, switch over and show a little bit on, um, rather than switching back and forth between the demo and presentation, I'm actually going to uh, show a little bit more on recommendations now, and then switch back to the slide deck and show kind of what the service does under the covers and, and how it works. So uh, in addition to um, in addition to being able to build, uh, oh, actually I will. Um, so um, so let's, I'll go ahead and switch back through here. Uh, so what the forecast uh, service is doing, it's really uh, learning the relationships between the different time series data sets. Um, so um, in building those correlations, uh, I didn't highlight it, but uh, there is a way to bring in other dates. So if there's certain key holidays that impact the time series or other uh, calendar events that impact things, you could bring that into the service to be able to generate it. Um, being able to you know, really the, uh, the seasonality and, and being able to build forecasts on new data. Um, one, of the, one of the pieces of metadata that's able to be brought into the service is the item metadata, uh, which gives you um, item similarity and, and that sort of thing to be able to identify that and be able to power um, those models. Uh, so these are the, the high level steps. I didn't step through, in the demo, I just showed kind of the end forecasting information. I didn't step through each of the steps, uh, but it really involves, uh, you know, loading, inspecting your data. Um, there's a really nice GitHub project out there on our uh, AWS Labs uh, site that lets you use things like Glue, uh, serverless ETL to get your data from one data set into uh, services like Forecast and Personalize. So you could use that library to do a serverless ETL, get the data into, the, into, these, um, into these tools really easily. Um, selecting the algorithm, uh, so you can select between the auto ML and uh, pre-built recipes uh, within there, uh, and then being able to tune the hyperparameters. Um, folks that are new to the ML space, a hyperparameter is really a parameter that goes into the model building process that impacts the uh, performance and how well the, the model performs. Uh, so if it's a neural network, it might be how many passes of the data uh, get, um, get trained on. Uh, it might be, you know, if it's an XG boost, it might be the number of trees and how deep the trees are. Uh, so the, it's various uh, parameters that go into the actual model structure and the model building process. Um, and what, we, what the service does, and uh, also services like SageMaker have the feature to be able to do like hyperparameter optimization, to be able to help pick the right hyperparameters uh, for the model, so it really makes a good model really, really, really great um, in most cases. So, and that's really the training, optimize the models, and being able to deploy them out. The uh, the three different data sets. Um, so I, I kind of alluded to this, but it's uh, worth calling it out for folks that are looking at building time series forecasting. Um, you really have target time series data sets. Um, and one common question I get is, um, you know, if I have uh, five different Let's say I'm trying to do time series, and it's really five different time series or 100 different time series, uh, but it's all representing like the same thing, so stock inventory or, or workforce or it, at different locations. or you know, It's really representing different, uh, the same thing. It's just multiple time series data sets. Um, that could be all in one uh, target time series, uh, and the item ID will be the item that that time series is pertaining to. Uh, so you could actually have multiple time series in that data set. It's not, you don't have to have a single, uh, single kind of uh, data group for each of those. Um, the related time series are uh, things that uh, um, really are not being targeted but might influence it. So um, if I'm trying to predict how many flights are going to be delayed, I might bring in things like weather, the predicted rainfall over time, right? Because as the rainfall increases, there's more delays, so there's a correlation there. Um, so the related time series lets you bring in other time series data that helps you build a better model or lets the service build a better model by bringing that data in. And then also the item metadata. So item metadata might be, um, you know, if I'm, if I'm trying to pred uh, predict the uh, demand of, uh, I just bought a new iPad, uh, iPad covers. Um, the item metadata might be uh, what size the iPad is for, uh, what color is it, does it flip, does it have a stylus holder. All that uh, information helps actually things like cold start problems and other metadata um, or other um, elements of the forecast to be able to um, build that model. So, 
So uh, mention some of the different recipes. Um, definitely, uh, if you're looking at using the service, uh, take a look at the auto ML feature as well. Uh, that lets it pick um, the, the right, um, essentially the right recipe or the right algorithm. Uh, the service is really calling uh, algorithms recipes. Um, and that's, that's the same nomenclature for personalized. So if you look at personalized, or we're going to uh, be demoing that here in a moment, uh, with uh, services like personalized, um, we're calling um, the algorithm uh, recipes. So uh, let's, uh, let's go ahead and actually uh, switch back uh, for the last time, I promise, uh, to the personalized demo. Uh, so in this next uh, set of demos, we're going to be showing how to build recommendations, personalizations. Um, there's really multiple types of personalization. So it's not just the traditional, uh, I'm a user, I liked this, what else will I like? Um, the service lets you build other types of models, for example, things like item similarity. So you might not have users at all involved, but which items are similar to each other. Uh, you, you can also build search optimizations. So um, these are uh, all different types of um, essentially algorithms under the covers uh, of Personalize. Uh, so within Personalize, uh, we have, um, you know, we, we really kind of have this dashboard. And uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to go into the data set groups and uh, show this data, uh, data set. So um, this data set is taking the movie lens data set. It's uh, almost like the hello world of recommendation engines. Um, uh, it's, uh, so it's taking the movie lens data set, building the, the, a recommendation model on it, but it's also building other models on top of it. And I'm going to show uh, an application that's been integrated with this here in a moment. So we're, we're going to step through like a real application using the API. Um, these, a, lot about, a lot about these services and really the entire stack is not only building the models and adding the intelligence, but being able to really rapidly integrate it with your application. It's, a, it's really a key, um, key element of the service. Uh, so what we can do here is we can actually uh, take a look at the data set. Um, so you'll notice a similar pattern. So when we were showing forecasts a moment ago, um, you, know, you saw concepts like schemas and data types and various fields. Um, in this, we're taking uh, user ID, item ID. So that's actually a user and a movie, uh, and the timestamp that they um, that they viewed that um, that information. Uh, what we could do also is um, within here we built this solution. Uh, so bar part of building the solution is um, you know taking that data set, taking all all three of the data sets really, uh, building that that model, and part of the solution uh, will also uh, give you back. Um, how well it's doing. Uh, so I'll, I'll show it in a moment, uh, but um, how well that solution is actually uh, performing under the covers. And then ultimately it's about building a, a campaign. Uh, so this campaign allows you to um, really deploy the solution out. Uh, I'm going to show some programmatic interfaces, so uh, kind of the uh, folks that are familiar with uh, coding and, and some code snippets. It's fine if, if you're not. We're not going to dive really, really deep in the code, but I did want to show uh, really what it looks like to integrate with these services uh, at a API and a code level. Uh, so we're going to step into that next. Um, but what we could do here is, uh, you know, we could actually go in and uh, very similar to, uh, uh, so for user uh, 101, here's the movie recommendations uh, for it. So uh, this is a way just to test it. Usually folks will integrate at that API level. So let me actually uh, show what that looks like here. So to do that, uh, I'm going to uh, bring up a, uh, a Jupyter environment. I happen to be using uh, Python here. I'm, I have this weird thing, I have to clo close all my tabs. Uh, so, okay. So, uh, in this example here, uh, I have this Jupyter environment, and uh, really what I want to show here is what some of these calls look like. Um, so, I've been showing everything through the console, um, but usually for a lot of these services, especially things like TextTract and Comprehend, and, and a lot of these are really usually integrated with a pipeline or, or an orchestration tool or that sort of thing. So the console's nice to be able to test things out, diagnose, um, that sort of thing, but a lot of folks will actually integrate more at the API level here. Uh, so you'll notice this is actually taking the movie lens data. Um, I actually generated everything that was in the console through, these, through this notebook. Uh, we have a lot of notebooks out there if you want to try this out. We have a lot of different samples out there if you wanted to try the programmatic access. If you go to our AWS lab site uh, to be able to try this out for yourself. 
so within here, uh, what we have is um, it's actually building the, the model. And I'm actually going to jump down here and show what the API looks like. Uh, so within the API, um, we actually have uh, this call here. And I'll make this a little bit bigger. So uh, what this is doing here is uh, actually right here. So this is actually just taking a, a, uh, a random sample, uh, pulling the first element out. Because you know, if this was a real system, actually, if this is the uh, UI that I'm going to show you in a moment, it would actually be picking the user that uh, you selected through the console or through the web interface. Uh, but just to show programmatically what it looks like, um, this is taking the user. Um, this happens to be taken also the item. Um, you don't necessarily have to have the item to build a recommendation as well. So, um, but if you have the item, it'll actually do uh, the similar items as well. Um, so it, when I showed the console, it was just the user ID. In this example, we're showing a different one where it's a user ID and a title ID and give me the recommended movies. And uh, you know, if we actually run this, uh, we'll see you know, this picked uh, user. Uh, it's just randomly picking a user, user 58, uh, uh, picking a movie that that user watched, uh, Princess Bride, a good movie. Um, and then uh, what are some uh, additional kind of recommendations for that user? Uh, what I could do here, you know, if I actually run this a couple times, uh, you know, no, uh, oh, I actually ran that cell again. Uh, you'll notice that uh, you know, the users are changing. Um, and very, very fast, right? You know, this is a real-time endpoint to be able to build these recommendations, uh, build this, these personalizations with. So what is this kind of looking like under the covers? Or, or how, how do you uh, end up integ integrating with this under the covers? Um, so this is a, a front end uh, that's really powered by uh, the machine learning algorithms under the covers here. Um, so this is, um, this is uh, a mock uh, movie recommendation site. What I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to select a random user uh, just because um, it, uh, I didn't have a particular user I cared about. Uh, you'll notice up here it says user uh, 276. Uh, so I just picked user 276. What we could do is we could actually ask for different sorts of recommendations. Uh, so within here, Uh, we could actually say, okay, I want to be able to uh, uh, say uh, what's personal rankings, what's recommendations, and similar items. So a similar item won't actually take user preferences per se. Um, you know, uh, what's a similar item to this iPad case uh, type of type of question. Uh, and these are all different recipes under the covers. So uh, the way the service really works, kind of under the covers here, is if we take a look. Uh, oh, I don't. Uh, somehow it just switched back to uh, the presentation. Oh, this says seven minutes. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm done. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so, <laughs> well played. Uh, so what you'll notice here are there's different recipes uh, for different types of systems. So if it's a user personalization, uh, this is actually uh, one of the recipes. Uh, under here, if it's a personalized ranking, uh, it's another recipe. If it's an item similarity, it's another recipe. So uh, a lot of people will look at the service at first and say, um, is it just user recommendations? It's actually uh, different facets of building that, that personalized environment. It's all about creating a personalized environment uh, for those users. So uh, what we're going to do here next is uh, uh, switch over and I'll show, I'll show one more thing and then uh, I guess I should finish up because everyone else is even though the timer says six more minutes. Um, let me actually show this. Uh, for, since I'm already in the code, um, this is actually the same forecast data showing how you get integrated through code. So, um, you know, just like the personalized has those APIs and the SDKs to be able to pull that information out and get it, uh, this is actually showing the time series uh, for the forecasting. So it's all about that API access. And you'll notice uh, to pull this data out of the service, it was literally like this line of code and I have the forecast for that user uh, under the cover. So that's why we say it's the AI services. Is you don't need that ML experience. You don't need that ML expertise to be able to build these models. Um, so if we could go ahead and switch back to the slide deck now, for real. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. Um, so just to kind of, uh, you know, I'll go ahead and uh, recap. So you saw how personalized work. Um, there's the same sort of concept with the recipes under the covers. Uh, one thing I should mention is there's a real-time uh, ingest feed for personalization as well. So if you have a, a web application or a client that's streaming real-time information, uh, you could build custom personalizations uh, on that to be able to uh, build those models and uh, get that information back um, and uh, uh, really help influence those models. So really what we've been focusing on are these AI services. Um, Unfortunately, I didn't have time to demonstrate all of them. I'd love to demonstrate things like recognition and recognition video and uh, being able to identify different objects in, in images and uh, create that as a searchable content. And um, there's a, a lot of really good use cases to be able to leverage all these AI services. I just focused on uh, some of the newer ones. I should mention that Personalize, uh, the second one we showed, uh, just went GA yesterday, so general availability. Uh, Textract is GA today as well. Uh, so both those services that we announced as preview at Reven are, are uh, currently GA um, as of uh, as of tech uh, track was a little bit ago and personalized uh, was was yesterday um, again ML services are focused on being able to streamline that ML build process uh, and that uh, models and framework level uh, kind of getting started uh, last couple slides here um, we do have some really good sources uh, we released MLU uh, some of the content we use internally uh, to be able to learn about machine learning and how to use uh, really the entire stack within your within the portfolio um, these uh, these slides will be on SlideShare uh, within a few days as well so uh, definitely feel free to I feel like uh, a celebrity when people take pictures so I, I kind of like it uh, no. <laughs> um, but uh, um, you will have these links as well uh, the other thing I should mention is um, we do have um, our ML solutions lab uh, so this is where uh, customers get paired with experts uh, to be able to build models. We have a lot of public sector customers starting to leverage this as well. Uh, and this is where uh, you work side by side with a data scientist uh, within or, our organization. Uh, so if you're interested in doing this, uh, talk with your account teams uh, and we'll, we'll kind of step through what that process looks like. And kind of lastly, um, definitely take a look at ml.aws. Uh, it has a lot of different, different links to be able to get started. Uh, feel free to contact me, um, you know, either LinkedIn or, uh, you know, uh, message me, that sort of thing. I'm happy to answer questions at all. Um, you know, uh, after the fact, we, unfortunately, in this room, we can't really do it very, uh, very easily. Um, the last thing I will mention is we, we literally read every comment from the surveys. Uh, so things that you liked, things you didn't like, uh, things that worked well. Uh, definitely feel free to uh, provide any feedback you want uh, on the session. Uh, and uh, definitely appreciate the time and uh, uh, thank you. <laughs>